we welcome you to the next episode of the indomitable spirit of water walkers. Someone say indomitable. indomitable. This morning I'm going to be ministering on will you see him high and lifted up. Will you see him high and lifted above everything else in your life? Reading from a very familiar passage to most from the book of Isaiah. And here is a very cool thing for theological students. The Spirit of the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night. I wasn't going to say that, but there we go. He woke me up in the middle of the night and said to me, did you know Isaiah has 66 chapters and there's 66 books in the Bible? And I went, whoa, and I got up and ran to see if he was right. Come on, somebody. And he was, um, but it was a rough night I was having earlier in the week, just sleep, nothing on my mind. And also, every one of those chapters of Isaiah coordinate with all the books of the Bible. Only God can orchestrate such a cool thing. At any rate, Isaiah says in Isaiah 6 and 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. He was high. Someone say high. And lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth, someone say the whole earth. Say my world is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with holy smoke. So I, Isaiah, said, woe is me, for I am undone. You know what? It's okay to be undone. Look at your neighbor and say, it's okay. You're not done, but you can be undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a live coal. He took from the tongs of the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your mouth, and your iniquity is taken away. Can you say amen? And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I, Isaiah, said, Here am I send me. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the reading of your word. Come, Holy Spirit, and do what only you can do in the time that I've asked you to do it. Speak to my brothers and sisters whom you love more than I do. Come, sir. You are everything and I am nothing, but together we can bring forth something eternal. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Look at your neighbor and say, see him high and lift it up. King Uzziah had a great reign. He was the monarch over Judah. A pride entered his heart, but he had a great reign for many years, and then he died. He was actually related to Isaiah, and Isaiah was in the moment of crisis. The country was in crisis. Does anyone think that's familiar? There were national disasters. An earthquake came. Horrible things were happening, and in that moment, Isaiah saw the Lord lifted high above every situation. I pray this morning, my friends, that you and I can see him high and lifted up above every situation. Someone give him a praise on faith. Come on. In the early days that I led worship, we used to sing a song high and lifted up. You remember it, Michael? Alan Asbury came in and helped us. We even did an international conference for you and high and lifted up. And it was so powerful. We need to declare that. Recently, a few years ago, I never saw it. Pastor Hank never watched it, but there was a cult following of a thing called Game of Thrones. How do y'all know about that? Game of Thrones. It was a cult following, and it was fascinated with the monarchs and taking the throne. But here's the deal. There is only one throne. I've been to England and seen thrones. I've been to Ireland and seen thrones. I Googled every major throne in the earth, but there is only one throne that is high and lifted up, and his name is the great I Am, the Alpha and the Omega. His title is Lord, and he is high and lifted up. He did not get voted in, therefore he cannot be voted out. You can hate him. You can despise 
praise him. You can shake your fist in the heavens against him. But he will continue to be God all by himself. He's holy. Someone say he's holy. Which holy at its elementary de definition, which I like, to, I'm an exhorter, so I'm not trying to give you a degree, a PhD. I'm trying to give you something to get you through the week. Holy means he's separate. He's all God by himself. He's perfectly pure. You'll never get on his nerves. Can I get an amen? You'll get on each other's nerves. Can I get an amen? You'll get on your own nerves. Can I get an amen? But he is perfect in all of his ways. That Hebrew holy means kudosh. And it means he is set apart. And in the Hebrew, there was not punctuation. You know, if someone sends you a text, or I'm a big exclamation. I love grammar and punctuation. So I love exclamation points. I mean, I have to make myself, don't put an exclamation point right there. Because I want to have impact. But in the Hebrew, they didn't have it. So when they wanted to emphasize a point, they would say it three times. Holy, holy, holy. To value how powerful it is. Which means there's no mixture in him. Your friend may love you today and hate you tomorrow. Someone may say you're the best thing since sliced bread today. And tomorrow they can't remember your name. I've been there, done that, and bought that t-shirt. But I'm going to tell you, your holy God has no mixture. He is always good. He is always kind. He is always holy, and his name is holy. Hallelujah. Give him a praise this morning. Look up. That was Pastor Hanks. For, he had three notes that I'll give you. I can't find his notes, but those three things will come in. You'll find them. Look up. Look up and see the Lord high and lifted up. We spend so much time looking down. In fact, have you seen what doctors have studied and those people that study how our bodies will form? And like 20 years from now, people aren't going to have a neck anymore because of this in the phone. I mean, they say chiropractors, I mean, they've already, if you, you Google it and look at it, and they'll show you the progression of what's going to happen to the human race because we're looking down. We're working on our automobiles. We're looking down. We're cooking or cleaning. We're looking down. We're doing something work. We're sitting at our desk, and we're looking down. But God says to Isaiah, and God says to you and I, look up, look up, look up, and see the Lord high and lifted up. You've been looking down far too long. You've been looking around far too long. Your eyes says the spirit of the Lord is on your circumstances and your situations. But God said, look up and see that I am, I am that I am, and I am high and lifted up. Hallelujah. One historian said that um, it's like uh, Isaiah was walking down a busy street. And the noise was like New York City, Times Square. It's crazy loud. The horns, people, you can't hardly move. Been there several times. Love the times in the past. Don't know if I'll ever go there again. We'll see what happens in that. Anyway, I'm going down that street, and you're hearing all that noise, and then all of a sudden you enter into, and the lights dim, and a spotlight goes on, and the noise is turned down. Whether you realize it, that's what went on in your spirit this morning. God turned down the noise of your world. He turned down the noise of your job. He turned down the bright lights and the clutter and the clatter and all the distractions, and he put a spotlight on the name of Jesus Christ. In the theater, they spotlight with a spotlight what they want you to look at. So if said actress enters from exit door stage left, they spotlight her so you'll know this is about her. I'm going to tell you in this passage and in your life this morning, the Lord has put a spotlight on himself. And he says, I am the Lord and I am the only God. And the highlight is on me. Look up. You've been looking down and around, but the spotlight says, I I am holy and I am for you and if I be for you I'm more than the world against you somebody give him a shout of praise in this house 
nations will try to derail him. They'll try to wrestle the power out of his hand. They'll try to take the sovereignty out of his control. But God will always be sovereign. You know, the thing about familiarity last this week while I was at this concert, it was songs I'd sung in the 70s that my sister and I, I mean, we just came out of the womb singing because our parents sung. We sing to each other on the phone. We call each other. And, you know, it's just wonderful to watch people just know all these words and start moving to the thing. But the bad thing is, the good thing about familiarity is a song comes on and you love it. Amen? But the bad thing is when you let familiarity affect you toward those things around you that are so beautiful that God has given you. You bought that new house and you loved it. And you sent pictures to everybody. I mean, it was new to you. You loved the roses in the yard. You love that big old tree that was 200 years standing in your thing, but all of a sudden you got busy in life and all of a sudden you didn't even notice the roses in your yard. You were too busy texting Johnny. Come on, somebody. You were too busy worrying about something. All of a sudden you see your house as all the damage in it and all the negative in it and what needs to be fixed in it. I know I'm speaking to someone this morning and you become familiar. You don't even notice that beautiful tree that you thought was great. And then you start taking people in your life as familiar. I, we, when I'm training young preachers, I said, the more you preach, the less they'll compliment you. And they'll say, no, pastor, don't tell me that. Now, I help people all over the nation, not tons. I'm not over speaking. I'm just trying to tell you the premise from which I do this. The more you do it, I've heard Stephen Furtick say it. I've heard Jake, Jake say it. I've heard Marcus Lamb say it. The less you'll get complimented, but you've got to live on little encouragement because people will become familiar that you do this all the time. We take familiar the servants in the house. We take familiar our children. We take familiar that we have a roof over our head. We take familiar that God is awesome all by himself. We take it familiar that God's always going to show up and show out. 36 people get baptized. Well, that was great. Good to see it. But then we lose our hope, we lose our courage, we lose our appreciation for God because we stop letting Him be the one who is glorious and grand all by Himself. And when He does mighty things, we stop dancing, we stop worshiping, and we take Him as familiar. But God said this morning, bring back the awe of who I am. Bring back the grandeur of who I am. Bring back the glory of who I am. Weep when the Spirit moves. Shout when it comes. Fall on your knees when the glory comes comes and then you will see he alone is God somebody praise him somebody praise him shake off that familiar into every servant in the house the more you do something the less sometimes people will notice but you do it anyway for the king I call myself an old goat and I mean it by a good way that I've learned to live by the the encouragement of Christ. So has Austin and Keith. Y'all don't line up wanting to shake the hands of the sound man every Sunday, do you? But without them, we would not have a service. We don't line up to shake the hand of Kelly Carson. I'm not getting on to you. I'm, I'm just making you and I aware. You are the best of the best. But we don't line up to Kelly Carson. Thank you so much for taking care of our children today. If I'd had to wrestle that little monkey, I wouldn't have gotten anything out of the kingdom. Come on. Parents, give Jesus a hand. And I could go on and on about the servants in the house. But we ought to let the awe and glory of God be seen in our lives. We ought to let it be seen in creation. I have a little outdoor study place and I can look at pastor's trees and look at his plants. Some of them we've had to remove because I couldn't keep up with it. But I sit out there and I look at those trees and I remember, I look at the sun coming up. And you and I should, when the sun comes up in the morning, when it sets at every night, we should speak what Psalms 92 says. At each and every sunrise, we'll be thanking you for your kindness. As the sun sets at night, we will say, you are so faithful. Because if you had to live in 24 hours of darkness, you would appreciate the sun coming up in the morning. But the sun comes up, we snooze our alarm. I know I'm preaching to both of us. We we snooze. I can't believe it's morning. Can't believe I got to get out of the bed. When we should jump up and say, you did it again, God. The sun just drove the darkness out. And I've got light for 24 hours almost. Give God a hand clap of praise. 
We ought to look at his creation and see his glory, see him high and lifted up. He makes the fish dwell in the habitat, the birds. Here's just a few of the animals. Google on your own time because they could have gone on forever that are just amazing. There is the tree frog. It freezes itself to death for seven months in Alaska. It freezes itself to hibernate. And been studied, it has glucose ten times of any other person. So when it becomes time in those cold, it just says, I'm going to freeze myself. I'm going to freeze myself. And then it freezes itself. And then when it comes forth, so did a big bang bring that forth? I don't think so. The jellyfish that you hate in the ocean is immortal. Did you know that? It returns to its original polyp state. It's immoral. It's immortal. If a shark didn't get it, it would live on. And then there's those little opossums that we love to hate. And they have possums. They have serum in their body that neutralizes snake venom. That's why you want them in your yard but not in their house. Hallelujah. Because they can get bit by a snake and then... Kill it just like that because their bodies. Who did that? Did the possum say, I'm going to have snake venom as my superpower? No, the creator of the ends of the earth knew that you need a possum to kill those snakes and take care of those rodents. Give him praise today. Come on. The hippopotamus who gets so ridiculed over his big fat backside. Come on, somebody. And his big old belly. He was that way to make a pregnant woman feel better about herself. But you know what? In a hippopotamus is the secrets in its skin. It's called a natural sunscreen, an antibiotic. It's called blood sweat. It combines two acids that they are never burnt by the sun. They can sunbathe, go in and out of the water all day long, and have a natural antibiotic. Your God did that. And what about the dung beetle? He can carry 1,000 times his own strength. And when two dung beetles fight, for the beautiful girl that they both want. They will fight to the death because God put in that beetle strength or the axolotl, which is a salamander. If a predator comes along and cuts off his arm, he just says, that's okay, that's okay. I'll now grow that back. And he grows back his limb with bones and blood vessels and muscles. He has a sequence of RNA that God put in him. That's your creator of the ends of the earth. That's your God that is high and lifted up. And when you see what he created, you ought to shout, holy is the Lord. Somebody praise him. Say say two more, Pastor Rhonda. Say it. Okay. Well, there's the every exterminator's dream, the cockroach. You know, when you're talking to an exterminator about cockroaches, I don't know whether to slap them or to, because they are so impressed with a cockroach. I've talked to a lot of them. Yeah, they're amazing. They would survive the apocalypse. Pastor Todd was the first one that told me that. But they will survive the apocalypse. They can live for weeks without their heads. So off with their heads does not help with the roaches. Because they'll just keep getting out there and doing their stuff. They have an open circulating system that if you cut a large organ, they will not bleed to death. But why? God and Noah let them on the ark. I have no idea. Come on, somebody. Except if you look up the ten reasons why we have cockroaches, you'll understand it. And finally, the bumblebee, which Pastor Hank used to talk about so powerfully, is aerodynamically impossible for him to fly. And every time one comes near my study place and I get scared, I just say, you know, you're not supposed to be able to fly. You realize that. It's aerodynamically impossible. They studied you. But that bumblebee just keeps flying and says, you can say whatever you want to say. I am a bumblebee and I'm going to keep flying for the grace of God. Because in humor I say, God created the beautiful flowering plants. God created the trees, the seas, the skies, everything and every living thing. He is almighty God. He is the most high God. Praise him one more time. And do you remember the day? That you thought you would never survive what you went through, but you did. That was the Lord high and lifted up over you. Maybe you didn't even know him. Maybe you walked away from him. Maybe you were still operating as somebody that did not even believe in him. But he was still operating as the most high God. And he was high and lifted up over you. And you are alive today because he was high and lifted up. Somebody praise him. 
36 people got baptized last week. He was high and lifted up. He's high and lifted up. Isaiah said of his kingdom, there will be no end. David said his throne is forever and ever. Daniel got a vision of the ancient of days sitting on the throne with fire and pure wool as hair and lightning and thunder was coming out and they begin to shout of his kingdom and his dominion there will never be an end our present president will come to the end of his term the last one did too but this king eternal immortal visible the only wise God he will be king forever someone praise him and his throne is forever must move on Isaiah said in the year king Uzziah died this is what I love Never thought about this, but I love that he said in the year. I love that he doesn't say in the moment that my precious cousin died who ruled so powerfully. Because sometimes in the moment we can't see how high he is. I love it that he says year. I love it he doesn't even say on the day. But I love it that he says in the year. Because sometimes seeing the Lord high and lifted up over a great loss in our life takes time. There's a song that sometimes is sung, a word is preached, and we see him high and lifted up. And then sometimes there's a passage of time in a season that we wonder, when will I see him high and lifted up over this situation in my life? I mean, I trust him and I'm going forth, but it's been this many years. It's been this many days. And I'm still not sure that I see him high and lifted up. I want to say to you this morning by the Spirit of the Lord as your lead pastor this morning that leads your pastoral team, Give God time to make sense out of that which makes no sense. He will, but give him time. Don't jump out of the boat. Don't abort your future. Don't give up on your destiny. Give him time. One of the most beautiful little moments in Scripture to me is in Luke 24. And Jesus' his followers, he's, he's, he's gone by crucifixion. He's been resurrected, but they don't believe it. And two are walking away from Jerusalem. They're on the Emmaus Walk. And they're walking away from where God told them. Oh, the Spirit of the Lord brought this to me early this morning, so I know it's for somebody this morning. They're walking away from the place the Lord told them to stay until he would visit them again. They're talking. They're seven miles away from where they should be. I love it when I was seven miles away from Jesus, you showed up. I love when I was 100 miles away from going in the right. Oh, maybe you never did. But I've taken some big distractions in my heart and my mind through my whole life. And he found me walking away from the same place he told me to stay. And Jesus suddenly shows up. But it says that God blinded them, Brother Keith, from recognizing him. And he said, what are you talking so intently about? And it says they stopped and looked at him with sadness on their face. And they said, you are the only one in Jerusalem who does not know. You are the only one who does not know we loved him. He was a great prophet. He was a healer. He was a great teacher. But the religious killed him. And here comes the ticker. This is what Holy Spirit gave me early this morning. They said, we had hoped. We had hoped he was the Messiah. You see, there are moments when we say, I had hoped this was my breakthrough. Come on, somebody. I had hoped this thing would have already turned around. I had hoped this prodigal would already come home. I had hoped this situation would be resolved. I had hoped by now, I mean, I kind of put it on the calendar by July 22, the Lord would have this all fixed through and through. Come on, somebody. I had hoped, but here I am. And then those two men went on to say, and our women have gone crazy. They went to the tomb. And an angel told them, right, that Jesus is no longer there. Then Peter encountered a disciple, or encountered Jesus. And all this is going up, and we are freaked out. We do not see him high and lifted up. Hold on just a moment, because in the moment when things don't make sense, he is still high and lifted up. He was high and lifted up, walking on Emmaus with them, but they could not recognize him. He hid himself. And then he began to teach the word of every messianic prophecy and all the predictions of himself. And they begged him, stay with us. And then you know he broke the bread. This is why I'm so 
bent on you getting in the Word of God. You'll only make sense of things when you get into the Word of God. It's every morning when I get in the Word of God, He consistently... He makes sense out of that which I cannot make sense of. It may be one line. It may be one verse. It may be a song that I'm listening to. And all of a sudden, my hands are up. It's beautiful to trust you, Jesus. It's wonderful to trust you because he opens your eyes and he opened their eyes. And they saw him for who he was. Somebody praise him. Somebody praise him. Josh, come and help me. And Jesus disappeared. Here, here's the deal. Within the hour, hallelujah, this is a word for somebody, maybe even by podcast. Within the hour, they were back on the road to Jerusalem. I love it that God can get me back on the track in an hour. I love that the enemy can rebuild what the, this, the Lord can rebuild what the enemy has taken years to destroy. What the enemy has done, God can build faster and greater. And in one second, what the enemy has spent so much time destroying. I'm going to tell you this morning to every believer listening in this room and by podcast. Jesus knows how to get you back on the road to your personal Jerusalem, to your calling, to your destiny. You may have wondered, but he says, give me time to make sense. There is always light after darkness. And for Isaiah, he sees the Lord high and lifted up as his heart is breaking over King Uzziah as he's questioning, what's the future going to be? I can't even imagine what next year's going to be. I can't imagine what tomorrow is going to be. But the Lord says that's okay Isaiah back up because I'm going to show you myself I'm going to let you see my train filling the whole world and my glory be seen someone give Jesus a hand clap of praise this morning come on this is what's so cool pastor taught about his train I, I love pastor Hank and I never watched Game of Thrones but oh lord as some of y'all know, we love time period pieces. We love King Arthur and Camelot, and we just loved it. it just, people, a lot of preachers love that thing. I don't know because it's a lot of warfare and the good guy wins. Amen? But as a king defeated the captain of another king, he would cut off the defeated king's train, and then he would sew it onto his train. So the longer the train went, the more victories you knew it happened. I wrote a, I had a picture, I forgot to bring it on the Sally's, the Vernons, and a few others. I wrote a, a theater piece that we did in the early days called For the Sake of the Call. And our stage was over there, and our Jesus was David Fisher, a little short guy. But anyway, we had a train that came all the way down that said King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I found a picture of it. It was really beautiful. The thing about earthly kings is they had to cut the train off of other kings' robes. Queen Elizabeth, when she was coronated in England, their pages had to carry her train. And it, they couldn't even, she was at the front and the train was still going at the back. Princess Diana, when she married Charles, the train went all the way back. But it says of God that's high and lifted up that his train, he fills the temple. It fills the earth. Your royal king has made a public spectacle over every enemy. And he has not had to sown because his train was given by God. He wants you to see him high and lifted up over every earthly king, over every monarch, over every single thing. Give him a shout of praise this morning. There's some incredible thrones, but they're all built by human hands. God's throne was built by him and him alone. And Isaiah gets preached. But I want to talk about this train for a moment for some ministry I think will happen as I journey toward the end. I'm not quite there yet. It's 10 minutes to 12. We got this. I love the train of his robe because it reminds me of the woman with the issue of blood. She had been marked unclean. And in the gospel, according to Mark and Luke, she went and grabbed the end of Jesus' garment. You see, she had been marked unclean. So she couldn't even say anything publicly. She was ostracized. She couldn't, if she got around anybody, she had to say unclean. She had bled for 12 years. Some say longer, but most say 12. Her blood flowing out of her life was symbolic of the life in Jesus. His train fills the whole earth. But just a touch of Jesus' garment raised a woman from her unclean. But what I love is he felt the power. She crossed the perimeters of what was legal 
to touch that him. But she knew Malachi had said, to you who believe the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. That wings in Hebrew is the same word that's found in numbers for the borders of the talith, that the garment that the rabbis would carry. And she knew if I can just touch a part of who he is. But when she touched him, he wasn't happy to leave her impersonable. He wasn't happy to leave her alone. But he wasn't happy because he knew she had been healed. But he didn't want to keep it mystical. I love a God that's God all by himself. But he says, come, I want to see you face to face. Come. He said, who touched me? And she said, I did. And she fell at his feet. He knew she had been healed. And at that moment, he could have sovereignly called her Darlene, Lydia, Betty, whatever her real name is. But he said, daughter you are made whole she had been unclean for 12 years but touching the hem of his garment what do you need from king jesus this morning what healing do you need what cleansing do you need what resurrection do you need from him he is here he says face to face i'm not gonna let you just touch the back of me just reach for me from a distance i'm gonna say come look me in the eye come right before me and let me see you for who you are and I will let you see me I am the Lord that heals you somebody give him praise this morning hallelujah so Isaiah all of a sudden those cherubim start the seraphim start crying out holy 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 and the Bible says as they cried the post of the door moved the foundation was shaken and it began to shake. I love it when we see God high and lifted up. He goes down to the foundation of who we are and he changes some things. I love that he shakes it up. I'm thankful that he shaked my foundation in 1983 to 84. And he continues to shake my foundation. When Pastor Hank was a general contractor building for Hollywood stars and Dr. Schuler, he would take me out to those million dollar homes and he would show me in our first marriage the foundation. I never thought they were beautiful, but he thought they were so beautiful. Look at this foundation. I say, well, it don't look like nothing to me. It's the foundation, honey. This is what's going to hold the house together. Now, after being married to him for so long, when I see a house built, I go and study the foundation. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus knows that our foundation can get really messed up. It can get a lot of mixture. It can get hurts, habits, hang-ups. It can get tears and losses. It can get to the point where it's not even we feel like working anymore. And Jesus said, I want you to see me high and lifted up. I want you to begin to trust in me. Let me shake the foundation of your worry. Let me shake the foundation of your fear. Come on somebody. Let me shake the foundation of your addiction. Let me shake the foundation of your low self-esteem. Let me change it so you can be changed from glory to glory to glory. Somebody give Jesus a hand clap of praise. So Isaiah, this is his response. You have to love his words. He says, whoa, whoa, I am undone. If you ever get into a worship service or in a time that you feel like something's not gone right for you or you just don't like what's inside of yourself and you cry a lot and you feel undone, that is such a good place. My best moments are when I feel undone in his presence. And he says, look in, Rhonda. I've looked up. Pastor Hank's second point was look in. And I began to look in. Lord, I don't like this about myself. Lord, I'm so sorry. Lord, I'm sorry about this anger. I'm sorry about this thing, Lord. I'm undone. And the Lord says, that's exactly where I want to have you. Undone is such a beautiful word. The Message Bible, Isaiah, gets even more dramatic. Doomday, doomday, we're all doomed. I'm as good as dead. I'm not going to live. That's what we feel when we get a glimpse of how good God is and how holy he is. And Isaiah is actually saying, how can I speak with a heart like this? How can I serve with imperfections? How can I do that? We used to sing a song in the early days. Change my heart, oh God. Make me ever new. You are the potter and I am the clay. Mold me and make me 
to your will this day. Change my heart, oh God. It's a wonderful thing to look in and say, I am weak, because then God says, I am mighty. It's a wonderful thing to look in and say, I am empty, for him to say, great, because now I can feel you. It's a wonderful thing to look inside and say, I am nothing, for God to say, great, because John 15 says, apart from me, you can do nothing, but with me, you can do everything through Christ. Someone praise him. Someone praise him. Don't leave, but just stand all over this building. I'm not quite done, but I want us to, the worship team to come. Please just keep listening to me. They're going to get their, their places ready. But please listen to me. This is what we say to God, what Isaiah was saying. God, I just, I just want you to know what you're getting into here. I have a problem with my emotions. I have anger. Lord, I'm a perfectionist. I'm hard on myself and I'm hard on everybody else. Lord, I'm a doubter. I compare myself. I'm cynical. I'm a procrastinator. I often deal with rejection. I'm lazy. I'm just pulling out some things somebody might say in this room. I'm hard-headed and I'm stubborn. I just want you to know what you're getting into. You you can try. That's what, what Isaiah is saying. Doomsday, doomsday, woe is me. How can I serve you? How can I be who you've called me to be? But then one of the seraphim, this was so cool. One of the seraphim who made the shake, shaking of the foundation, saying holy, all of a sudden flies and gets a coal from the hot altar and touches Isaiah's mouth and says, you are clean. Let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus took a fiery hot blood from his own body. And God said in 1 John 1, if we, we have sin and we confess it, he is faithful to forgive us. That's the coal from the hot altar. The Bible says, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is for the remission of your sins. Remission is cancellation of all doubt. The Bible says, have boldness to enter the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus where God offers you not a coal from a seraphim's mouth I don't want that I want the fountain that's drawn from Emmanuel's veins I want to plunge beneath that and lose all my guilty stains someone give him a praise he's high and lifted up begin to prepare your heart I'm not quite done for how you're going to see God high Paul said in the book of Colossians, you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with Christ Jesus. Ephesians said he set you in heavenly places with Jesus. And he has taken those things against you and nailed them to the cross. He wiped out the handwriting of requirements against you. So therefore, we don't have to say, um, we don't have to say woe is me. We say, Lord, I'm entering with confidence into your presence. I'm drawing close to your mercy and your grace. We used to sing a song in the early days. Take me into the holy of holies. I take me in by the blood of the lamb. And we say, take the coal, cleanse my lips. Here I am. But now we don't say take the coal. We say, I receive the blood of Jesus. Lord, I'm undone in your presence, but I see you high and lifted up. I'm glad you know what you're getting into when you called me. Because here I am with all my weaknesses and my imperfections. But I come by the blood and I say, here I am. And then that voice was, who shall we send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. So this is what I want to say to you as we end this. Then you and I said, after realizing we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Here am I. You already know everything about me, God. You know every imperfection. You know every dark corner of my mind. Every imperfection. But because of Calvary and the resurrection, here am I. Send me, Lord. Not to Afghanistan. That might happen. Not to Iran. That might happen. Not to where we come, you bring you up front and pray over you and it's so grandiose that you're going to the exotic islands of Jesus. Jesus, that would be easier. No, send me to the people I work with. Send me to the broken. Send me to the hungry. Send me to the hurting. Send me to those going through trials. I'm not looking for a title. I'm not
not looking for a big platform. Send me to the people I live among. If you believe it, praise him this morning. Come on, praise him this morning. And here's the deal before we pray to you. Let me tell you. If I lead Tina to Christ, then Tina leads Sarah to Christ. Sarah's come to know Christ because I led Tina to Christ and Tina led Sarah to Christ. Then Sarah leads John to Christ. John leads his family to Christ because I led Tina to Christ. Tina led Sarah to Christ. Sarah led John to Christ and then John leads his family to Christ. Then John's grandfather leads his whole street to Christ. And then John's grandfather leads his neighborhood to Christ. And then all of a sudden, the parents lead their friends to Christ. And all of a sudden, because I led Tina to Christ, Tina led Sarah to Christ. Sarah led John to Christ. John leads his family to Christ. John leads his grandfather to Christ. His grandfather leads his neighborhood to Christ. Then the families begin to lead their children to Christ, their parents to Christ, their friends to Christ. And all of a sudden, the city is saved. Stop trying to save the world. Just lead Tina to Christ and let the work be done by the gospel. Give him praise. I'm done preaching. Give him praise this morning. Here am I. Send me, Lord. Here am I. Send me, Lord. Send me. The team is going to sing this. You want to move out and stand in the altars. This is our benediction. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And as they sing it, what I prayed over you, Holy Spirit, only you, I know only you can make this happen, is that you see him in your mind lifted up above your situation. How do I do that, Pastor? Let me just break it down to one-on-one. Declare him higher than anything in your life. Declare him higher. Declare him great. Come on. Make your place of worship, either standing here or standing in your seat. Make this the benediction. See him high and lift it up. Saw the Lord seated on his throne. He was clothed. 